what I perceive as the future of natural language work in AI. Okay, so the main thesis that I will be propounding is that the next frontier is making AI systems much more human-like in how they understand and generate language. So three main, hello, okay. Three main points, we need to graduate into end-to-end -end applications, down with the leaderboard, that's games, that's not real work. We need to treat meaning centrally, and we need to be able to have systems that can explain what they do. So this is something that is broadly understood, even by researchers at Facebook who say, essentially that uh, we need to be learning meaning in the flexible and generalizable way that humans do. And uh, some other colleagues uh, say that it's hard to see how human level understanding can be achieved without greater attention to common sense. I fully realize that most of the stuff that you do does not deal with this type of thing at all. Uh, so, uh, l last year, uh, the um, uh, AAAI organized a committee to decide on research priorities to realize societal benefits of AI. And uh, among other things, they stressed uh, topics such as integrated intelligence, which means combining modular AI capabilities. We saw in one of the previous talks a huge number of individual capabilities that certain systems can perform, uh, so we need to combine them. Create shared repositories of machine understandable world knowledge uh, and understand human intelligence. They also talked about meaningful interaction, which means productive collaboration in mixed teams of humans and machines. And uh, another thing is self-aware learning. Uh, not what we know as machine learning, but real learning the way we do. Uh, and we need to work on that. Incorporating prior knowledge, developing causal models. In other words, allowing machines to explain why certain decisions were made, including decisions and how to understand language. Uh, all right, so once again, next frontier is uh, making AI system much more human-like. All right, so but how do we do that? Uh, so, uh, what could we do? We, we have the technologies and the science of today. So, here are some uh, uh, big slogans. Approaches based on analogy, that is anything that is done in machine learning, whether probabilistic or connectionist, simply won't do it. Uh, we can discuss why separately. I don't want to spend time right now. And knowledge-based approaches will, but they will need a lot of help in doing so. So we need all hands on deck. And as it says here, I fully understand that this is much easier said than done. Okay, so uh, we need hybridization. And this is, by the way, the slogan of the day. We have been he uh, hearing about hybridization for a decade at least. All right, but an interesting point is how to hybridize. So for people invested in advanced applications of machine learning or whatever uh, shade, uh, it is natural to think about grafting elements of knowledge on machinery and machine learning oriented architectures. This morning, Professor Shoham uh, told us about the use of WordNet, which by the way is not really machine understandable knowledge. It's a dictionary. Uh, so because the purpose of that research is to improve the performance of those applications, but those applications won't make the grade. So what we need to do, we need uh, go beyond addressing partial tasks, we need knowledge-based systems. 
Okay, so a few, a few questions in general about human language processing. So have you ever wondered why people are so good at ambiguity resolution? You know, often, uh, some examples, we need to be shown that there was an ambiguity in an input because we resolved it without even realizing that there was an ambiguity in an input. The standard response, response to that question is uh, to use the context, but this is almost not an answer because context is in Marvin Minsky's uh, terminology a, a suitcase word. It means whatever people want it to mean in various um, um, applications. So what is uh, context? Well, we can think about it and I, the diagram is coming. So uh, some more questions about what people do. Uh, why do you think people interrupt one another in dialogues? And it's not only because we all have bad manners and I'm guilty as charged. Why people are so good at understanding unexpected, unexpected input? and the hint is they don't use a training corpus. Uh, how do people learn meanings of new words? So a personal recollection is Zerbuvit. So I learn it from you know what, right? From the Gashashim. And I have never used it myself and I have never seen it in a text and I remember what it means. Huh? Well, right, I can even tell you where the explanation is, what the chupchik shele kumkum, what chupchik means, because that's my native tongue, right? But uh, that is immaterial, you see? I could, I could uh, explain it, but I would be playing the role of a linguist, not a user of language, and we are unbelievable users, uh, sorry, Yes, unbelievable users. We are very good understanders of language. Okay, so why do people phrase their utterances differently when talking to different people in different contexts? It's everybody knows that, right? Well, if we talk with a five-year-old and try to explain to a five-year-old what a violin is, it's one thing. But if we want to talk with a grown-up or even a musician, then it will be an entirely different thing. Also, another thing. Uh, how, uh, have you wondered how people keep their cognitive load within workable limits? when pro processing language input. Because, uh, you see, this is what we are about. We are extreme examples of laziness. We don't want to expend more uh, effort than we really minimally need, minimally need in order to understand things. And we are very good at this. We need to teach, oh, what happened? We need to teach machines to do this. So. All the above functionalities and a few more have been demonstrated in prototype systems built by our team the, at the Lea lab at Rensselaer Polytechnic and before working there I have worked in a number of other uh, places uh, including uh, the Center for Machine Translation and Carnegie Mellon and I would like to second Ar Alon's mention of Jaime Carbonell, who died last week, who was a seminal person in organizing this work. He brought me in, so <laughs> uh, that was uh, very good. Um, anyway, so uh, I don't have enough time at all to talk about the content. I will give you a few glimpses about that. So we have an ontological world model of about, I don't know, 10,000 concepts, about 16 properties each. And we have a connected uh, semantic lexicon of about uh, 30,000 senses for English. We did work on lexicons of other languages, but not recently. Okay, uh, and at this point, the objections, the typical objections to this uh, way of work, because you see we worked, we actually worked. We didn't take somebody else's annotated corpus and somebody else's system of uh, processing it, put it together, and produced a paper. No, we actually worked for, for what we have produced. Uh, so the objections are, well, manual knowledge acquisition is too expensive, it's wishful thinking, 
uh, it's ivory tower uh, tower pontification which by the way it could be of course because you know I'm I'm uh, I work in academe so that's how it is and uh, you would say we need to compete in the marketplace today etc yeah uh, uh, all of that uh, are uh, interesting objections but uh, they uh, could be responded to and also from the point of view of applications we need to know that you know you need to get ahead of the competition and what you are dealing today with is yesterday's technology of tomorrow you need today's technology of tomorrow right so there we go and you know, disruptive technologies and all these slogans we need uh, to, you know, not only pay lip service. Being realistic is good, but it does not always mean going for the low hanging fruit, right? How about some slow moving meat? Uh, all right, so uh, now let's talk about hybridization done right. We need AI systems that people can treat as colleagues and not just as prosthetic or even orthotic devices. So systems that can understand and use the meaning of the input, uh, 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 the systems that cannot do that will not make the grade. So the answer is we need meaning-oriented cognitive architectures supported by data and ML-based capabilities. So the proposal summarized is instead of grafting knowledge on machine learning configurations, what we need to do is use machine learning methods to enhance knowledge-based cognitive systems, and we are in the business of uh, doing that at prototype level because we are an academic lab. Okay, so in the time remaining, I will try my best to persuade you that this is not wishful thinking. And to do so, I will briefly describe just a few facets of the R&D program that directly addresses many of these issues. It's a very long-standing program. It started in 1980 when my students and I at the Hebrew University built the first morphological analyzer for Hebrew rule-based and all that. And uh, by the way, it's an unbelievable sight to see so many people uh, doing a natural language in this country because when I started 40 years ago, there were two and a half of us. Uh, and this, this really is very different. So, the latest book size report about the current state and the latest results from this uh, program, from the language component of this program, will be published by MIT later this year in the book called Linguistics for the Age of AI by Marge McShane and myself. It describes the language processing modules of the language endowed intelligent agents, or layers, and the cognitive models of treating a comprehensive inventory of language phenomena and language use. So within our scopes, uh, this is all within our scope, and uh, uh, our models and systems address those questions that I described briefly head on. So uh, a few diagrams, you don't need to read them. There will be no quiz at the end of the, of, of the period. So uh, this is a uh, diagram of the knowledge, sorry, of the language understanding system. It has many components, both processing components and knowledge components. The important part for today is that at least three of the early components are machine learning based. Okay. By the way, it immediately raises the issue of grounding. Everybody understands what I'm talking about? You know, the outputs of those systems need to be put in sync with the knowledge-based uh, uh, inputs, right? or rather background knowledge. Okay, so this is the ONTOSEM, but ONTOSEM is a part of a larger encompassing uh, architecture. Uh, which is onto agent. It's a big cognitive architecture in which only those these three parts relate to language. My point is that you cannot do 
real work in language understanding without also working on reasoning and also working on connecting other um, uh, modalities of perception. And we have done this in a few limited but still uh, comprehensive throughput systems. I can talk, I will talk just very, very briefly about them. But the important part is functionalities. And this is uh, a subset of the functionalities that we address uh, very seriously. So ambiguity resolution of many types, you all know uh, that uh, uh, it, it, we can talk about details later if anybody is interested. But let's talk about others. So treating anomalies, our systems are expected to face unexpected input. And uh, we do this with a variety of times, the types of such inputs. Uh, we also have uh, built our latest uh, implementation of the analyzer incrementally, so uh, the output get, gets produced even before the end of the sentence uh, is reached. Uh, a, a more important uh, issue is actionability. Uh, I will talk about it a little bit. Uh, just a little bit later, uh, which means processing only enough to understand and act. Uh, right, mind reading. Have, have you heard about this? It's not about sir, the circus and, and such. It's about, okay, uh, it's modeling the knowledge and goals and plans of others, of interlocutors, right, in order to be able to understand what they're saying. Uh, learning, and we're talking about real learning, human-like learning, uh, uh, in four modes, by reading, by being taught in language, by experiencing, by reasoning. I will not be able to talk about this in great detail. I have just one example. And also introducing multiple modes of perception uh, so that we can understand uh, dialectics, you know, uh, give me that, and so on. Uh, so um, uh, all of this is uh, worked on. Don't look at this. This is too much. Uh, but we have the idea there is that we are interested in comprehensive applications. It's not just like we do. Uh, let's say. Um, oh, I cannot point. Can I point? Can I point? Yes, I can point. Dynamic constraint tightening. Yeah, so uh, we have some constraints in static knowledge resources, and we have algorithms that allow us, based on uh, the situation model that we have, to uh, uh, tighten uh, constraints. It's OK. Uh, right, but uh, this would be one of those uh, separate tasks that people are talking about. Our interest is in uh, having an entire uh, process. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some other things. So most approaches to automatic language processing, irrespective of the methods they use, have as their ultimate proclaimed goal a complete and correct analysis of language inputs. It's not what people do. Humans do not always go for complete and correct analysis. Uh, well, illustration is if human says to robot, go get the fire extinguisher and the robot should start to move before the dialogue turn ends. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, OK. So we already implemented this capability to, uh, by uh, having the agent seek a request in for a request action speech act and language input before deciding on what action other than, uh, on any action other than creating and storing a text meaning representation. By the way, what is this dot? Where does it go? Yeah, I know that this is a pointer, but how do I manipulate it? That's a question. You know, this is technology. This is real stuff. So, uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, the illustration of learning lexical items. So we have... Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. Wow. You know, magic. Uh, right. Uh, so we have built over the years an interesting uh, system, an intelligent agent that is um, a virtual patient. 
uh, an, an agent which is disembodied, but has a very detailed uh, uh, simulated model of physiology and pathology, and can reason and uh, uh, communicate with uh, a user in natural language. And the idea uh, is to train physicians to diagnose and treat diseases, and you can guess why this is needed, uh, and that's because when, uh, you know, the last uh, person in uh, a, a class uh, of a medical school, you call him doctor or her. So they need to actually see the cases of rare diseases in those two weeks that they have gastroenterology in their, in their class. So. Uh, we built this over the years with the help of a team of physicians, and uh, uh, so uh, the different uh, virtual patients were endowed with different levels of knowledge and different levels of understanding language. Right, so this is just a small, small part of the dialogue. Uh, it's uh, the uh, um, user says, I'd like to set you up for an EGD, which is a diagnostic procedure. Anybody knows what an EGD is? Yeah, somebody knows. So it's great, but the agent doesn't. So uh, right here, it starts learning it. From what, so it knows now that it's a diagnostic procedure. It proceeds and um, uh, records uh, an uh, incomplete uh, concept in the ontology and an incomplete, uh, um, sorry, and a, an entry in the lexicon. Uh, so, uh, okay, just uh, look at this. Uh, this is just an example. If you, uh, the doctor says you have a collagia, so the concept of collagia is learned and made a child of disease because the agent knows that this is a diagnostic dialogue and there is uh, um, uh, reasoning behind this. And the noun echolasia is learned and mapped to the concept echolasia. So what we are trying to say here is this. Uh, you have, you seed the ontology and the lexicon the best you can, and then you can continue uh, by uh, automatically learning with the possibility of mistakes, of course, just like people learn uh, these things. So learning by reading, if you want uh, to, instead of dialogue, use it, um, uh, learn from reading, then you do any musicians in the room? D does anybody know what a minus one con uh, concept is? So if there is a score where one instrument is missing, right? So here we have a sentence in which you know all the words but one. And we are looking for such. This is a dissertation of, actually two dissertations of my students already of some time ago. I, I don't have the time to talk about this. Now, illustration of mind reading, which we also um, implemented in one of the systems. Uh, it's question and answer, and the answer depends on whether the agent is capable of deducing the goals behind the question. So, and honest to God, I didn't uh, prepare for this situation right now because the question here, uh, have you traveled recently from a doctor to a patient? Uh, so, and we have several patients that are, quote, smarts and several patients that are, quote, dumb. So the smarts and have mind reading capabilities. And so Martha uh, answers answers, uh, no, I haven't been anywhere that might have made me sick, right? Uh, and look, uh, generation, uh, text generation, separate issue. I am not talking about this, but it was able to decide to generate that. Whereas Martha Dam says, no, I have not traveled recently, uh, and she is truthful, whereas Thomas Dam, uh, you see, says, yes, I traveled by automobile recently. Bad English, by the way, but uh, that's not the point. And the um, uh, good answer is, once again, I haven't been anywhere that makes me sick. 
All of that needs to be prepared, and that's not language proper, it's reasoning behind it, and it is not at all possible to do by producing a large number of textual contexts. Okay, so I'm finishing because I'm, I'm sure I'm over uh, time already. The purpose of this talk was to convey the overall philosophy and approach that we are following at our lab. I touched upon just a small subset of models and systems under the develop under development there. So if you want to know more, drop me a line at zavedomo at gmail.com or talk to me right now. Or if there is time, ask me questions now. Thank you.